Praise the Lord. It's so good to see everybody uh, here tonight um, on a Saturday night. There must be a hunger for God in the house. I appreciate people that uh, want to come in and hear God's word and uh, pray prayerfully tonight. The Lord is going to speak in this place. And I just want to say as well, it has been uh, for, for those of you that come to church here. What an incredible pastor and wife team that you have. Can somebody say amen? Uh, just beautiful people. Uh, I've known Pastor Aaron over uh, the last year or two. We've met at places and talked. But this has been like a couple of days at the house. And if you want to get to know somebody, live at the house, right? Because you get to know all about them. And uh, it has just been such a... An incredible joy. Uh, you have people of integrity that lead the church here, and uh, we're just so blessed to be here. Uh, real quickly, too, with, uh, with you know, uh, Pastor Aaron was, you know, asking about what missions work we would, you know, we do a lot of great missions work. I just finished a time in India. Uh, we had 1,400 pastors. We had about 15,000 people on an open air evangelistic. About 2,000 people came to Christ. Hindus came to Christ. Somebody shout amen, right? And uh, it was just so glorious. Uh, people were healed out on a field. It's just some good thing. We're in Albania doing a conference. But uh, if, you, if you don't mind, uh, you know, uh, the... The offering that we do here, I, uh, so I had said to Pastor Aaron, I just really want whatever you give to go to missions. But we're going to be doing a conference. I'm, I'm going to be doing a conference with Pastor Carter Conlon. Uh, we're going to Cairo, Egypt. And then I'm going to the south part of Egypt where uh, there's a lot of churches. We're going to be doing a conference, some evangelism. And uh, we are believing God for an awakening around the world. Amen. We need God to move in the days that we live. And we need a move of God here in America. So uh, thank you. Uh, this has absolutely nothing to do with the message. So uh, here you go. But, you know, you guys are as a church plant. Uh, I planted a church in Jacksonville. Uh, probably our sanctuary was probably a little less than half the size here uh, when we started. It was a little storefront. And I've heard a couple people tonight go, you know, our bathroom, you have to walk really far to get to the bathroom. Anybody said that before? Okay, there, nobody's raising their hand. Okay, there we go. Uh, and, and so, you know, somebody was saying that tonight. Well, here was our bathroom situation in our first church. So we had our little church. And you didn't have to walk far at all. As a matter of fact, the bathroom opened up to the sanctuary. So when I was preaching, if you had to go to the bathroom, uh, not to be guttural here, but whatever happened in there, we could all hear it. And uh, you know, it really didn't add anything to the anointing, I will tell you. And so uh, that was, our, and I, I would always say like, how in the world is this church going to grow? Uh, we just had some of the most awkward things. But I can tell you this, when the word of God is preached, and the church is alive and in the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you what people will beat the doors down to get inside a place where the love and the presence of God is at. Can you say amen to that? So that's really uh, that's really our heart. So tonight I am going to be uh, preaching a message. Uh, it is going to be uh, tonight. Uh, the, the title of it is called uh, Risking All. It's on the life of Paul. Before I get into the message, I rarely ever do I do this. But it's a Saturday night, uh, probably you guys have had a busy day, and I just thought I would start with something poking fun at the world in which we live, Can right? So um, how do you know that the whole selfie thing has just gotten out of control? People, you know, selfies everywhere, trying to take a selfie, and the best selfies and the most likes. Well, uh, I tend to be adventurous. Any adventurous people here? Uh, I'm adventurous. My wife is absolutely not adventurous. She could, you know, she, she uh, not, doesn't care for adventure really at all, anything that scares her. Um, but, you know, there's people who risk everything for the most futile things in this world. And one of the most futile, futile things that you can risk your life for is the selfie, right? And, but people do some crazy things. So I picked off a couple of the, probably of the craziest things that I've seen of people trying to get a selfie so they can get a like. And uh, I don't know if we have, uh, do we have those on the screen? Or can we look over here and see? Is there something on there? No. Nope. Oh, here we go. So here is a man uh, surrounded by sharks in the ocean taking a selfie. No, thank you. Uh, the next one <laughs> is a guy at, at a volcano, a live volcano taking a selfie 
uh, and, and a live volcano, risking everything for that, for that picture. Uh, the next one is there in Rio de Janeiro. I don't know if you've been there before, uh, but there's a big Jesus. So he's taking a selfie of Jesus and uh, really high. And then the last one is the running of the bulls. And here's a man taking a selfie. Now, you know, hey, I, not to, don't, don't want to make a big deal of that. But uh, here's the thing. There's people in this world that do such futile things and they, they you know, for adventure or thrill or for a like, they risk everything. Uh, tonight, I want to talk to you about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul who risked everything, but what he risked his life for is to preach the gospel. And I want to talk about what, what that means. Tonight, we're going to, you know, really jump into this, uh, this heart and this idea. I, listen, first and foremost in the scripture, I love Jesus. Can everybody say amen to that? I love Jesus more than anything. He's the greatest example, greatest stories, greatest ministry is Jesus. After that, I really love the Apostle Paul. And one of the reasons that I like the Apostle Paul, uh, secondly to Jesus, is that he, he says, I'm a sinner of sinners. Actually, he calls himself the chief of sinners. He understands his brokenness. He understands his frailties. And yet he's used in such a powerful way by God. And you know, sometimes I can identify with somebody who has failures, that's walked through difficulties, that's lived through hardships. And, and we sit there and, and say, hey, God, with all of my failures, with all of my inadequacies, God, I want to be used. I want to be used for your kingdom. I want to do something in this life that matters. Amen? And that's, I mean, that's my heart. So I can identify with this, with this, this, this thing with Paul. And we're going to go through and see, you know, how, what was it that motivated him? Because a church tonight, um, and I know we have a couple of churches represented here. So this is for Exano or wherever church, whatever church you've come from. But what are the foundation stones in the church? And what are the foundation things in, in the life of a believer that gives us the life and the power and the energy to truly walk in the darkest parts of this world and to speak the life and the presence and the power of God? Like, because listen, I want to make a difference in the world that I live in. I don't think that God created me and put me here on this planet just to go through, live a few years and die and go sing with the angels in heaven. As beautiful as that is, my prayer is, God, as many people as I can take with me, I want to take with me. I want to take my family. I want to take my friends. I want to take my neighbors. I want to take people that don't know Jesus. And listen, that is the call that God, I believe, as much as he wants to save us and do a work in our life, he wants to see a church that's alive. In the days that we live, there is every excuse we can say. The, you know, the, uh, our culture is woke. Uh, people are so liberal. Nobody wants to hear the word of God. But can you consider for a moment, Paul lived in a generation that were complete pagans. And now he goes out to this pagan, you know, wh whether it's Rome or Greece, uh, he, he's going to these pagan cultures and he's talking about Jesus. Now, I think that we know from the world that we live in right now, how many know that Jews are not really well liked? And I will tell you this, in the days that Jesus lived, Jews were no more like then than they are now. And you have a man who's born as a Jew who's convicted by the Roman government of a crime and sentenced to death. And so he goes to this, he, he goes to this death sentence. He dies on a cross. And then the story goes that he rose three days later. And now you're walking to pagans that don't even much know what the Jews believe, much less what a Christian is. And he is now compelled with a message to go and speak the word of God. I want to tell you, that's a tough task. And sometimes if you think, well, the world that we live in is tough, it does not even begin to compare to the world that Paul walked into. And yet he spoke the word of God to two thirds of the known world in the days that he lived. He went to Asia Minor. The Bible says he, he, um, held, he was there for three years in Ephesus. They planted churches and the Bible says that every man, woman and child in Asia Minor heard the gospel. Can I just ask you a question if you're here at Exano or whatever church? Have people within five miles, has every person within five miles of the church that you attend heard the gospel? 
Probably not unless you live in the country. If you live way out in the country, you go, yeah, I live on a farm and there's 12 cows and they've all heard me preach. I, but for the most part, even if I said you, I was saying to Pastor Aaron earlier, if we said Exonal Church, in the next three years, every person who lives within five miles of, of this church would hear the gospel, that would be a daunting task. But can I tell you, it's possible because with God, all things are possible. So what is it that moved a man who is what I believe the greatest theologian who's ever lived? I believe that he is the greatest missionary who has ever lived. And he is the greatest church planter who has ever lived. And it's important the foundation stones that are laid into a church because that church will thrive and flourish based on what things are cultivated and grown into a church, right? So we're going to talk about that tonight. Lord, I pray that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word. God, I thank you, Lord, for people that have come out on a Saturday night and they're hungry for your word. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name tonight, Lord, that you would remove the voice of any man or any person. And God, I pray that you would speak from heaven. I pray that you would reverberate in every heart. Lord, we pray, God, for life to come out of this place tonight. Lord, I pray that you would speak from heaven in the power and the word of the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would raise up a church and believers here in this Milwaukee greater area, Lord, that are full of the power and the life of the Holy Spirit. God, we are believing you to do great things in this church and every church in the city. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Glory to God. There's a few people in scripture that risk everything. Hezekiah, Nehemiah, uh, Rahab risk everything to save the two spies. One of the people in the, in the Bible who risk everything, her name was Joanna. She lived, the Bible says that she lived in, in Herod's house when John the Baptist is being beheaded. Uh, here she's living in the house and following Jesus. She, she uh, risked everything to serve God. And so as we go through today, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 9. Um, and we're going to go to um, Acts chapter 9 and, and verse 3. And we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul. What was it that motivated him, that drove him uh, to speak the word of God to the generation that he lived in? Here's the first thing if you're taking notes. He had an encounter with Jesus. Now I want to I make a, just a, a point here. Maybe a small point to you. I believe it's a greater point. There's a lot of people in America that have had an experience with Jesus and in, in that they've heard about Jesus. Uh, one, uh, one of the old uh, church historians said this. He said, the greatest enemy to the church is mental assent. That means believing in your mind, but not really letting it drop down into your heart. So an experience with Jesus means you can feel guilty you can know that Jesus rose from the dead. I think we, we all know this, that the devils in hell know that Jesus rose from the dead, and yet they're not saved, right? So wh wh what, is, what does an encounter with Jesus look like as opposed to an experience? There's a lot of people that's prayed a prayer, a lot of people that's gone through a baptismal tank. I want to just tell you, praying a prayer does not save you. And going to a baptismal tank does not save you. It is when you have an encounter with the God of heaven. Now, I want to make sure I'm really clear on this. I'm not talking about emotions. I'm not talking about weeping. I'm not talking about being stirred emotionally. Uh, sometimes people have an encounter with God and hardly move at all. It's not a physical or emotional thing. It's a very deep spiritual thing when you come in, in, and encounter the presence of Jesus Christ. Paul had that kind of encounter. Here's what it says in verse three. Now he's journeying, he's going uh, to persecute, uh, he's going to persecute believers. Actually, he's going to kill and imprison uh, believers as he journeyed and came near Damascus. And suddenly a light shone to him from heaven and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, before I get too deep into this passage, I want you to recognize something. Paul never personally met Jesus. Jesus is saying, why are you persecuting me? Paul, as far as we know, never persecuted Jesus. But I want you to see this. He was persecuting the church. And when he persecutes the church, Jesus says, when you persecute believers in the church, you're persecuting me. 
And that's really important to me because we do work in a place where people are being killed, that people are being uh, beaten, people are being tortured for their faith, and yet they faithfully risk their life to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that we talk and we say to these individuals is, uh, listen, it's hard because we, we live in America. We have a soft life here. We, sometimes we don't, we don't realize it because there is a culture that's very difficult here. But when you go to places around the world, there are people who are being persecuted and dying for their faith. And you know, one of the things that I believe that the church should never forget those individuals, that we stand with them and we pray for them because when you touch a believer, you are touching the body of Jesus. And Jesus says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Now, Paul, uh, he, uh, at the time, Saul, he says, the Lord, uh, who are you? He doesn't even really recognize. And then Jesus declares himself, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick a, a, against the goads. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I want to just, I want to just say this. When you truly have an encounter with God, you, you go, well, how do you know that somebody has an encounter with God? Because you have the response that Paul has. When somebody has an experience with Jesus and they go, hey, Jesus, what can you do for me? Uh, hey, Jesus, you know, I want you to make me happy or give me joy or help me out with my problems. All of those things are good. It's certainly good. But listen, this is the difference between somebody who has an experience and an, and an encounter. You say, I don't know if I've had an encounter with Jesus. I'll tell you how to know if you've had an encounter with Jesus. Because when you have an encounter with the God of heaven who spoke the worlds into existence, your response is always this. It is always, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because now it's about what I do for you rather than just what you can do for me. We all agree here that Jesus does great things for us. Can we say amen to that? We all agree with that. But listen, the question is, is your heart soft? Has your, has your heart been softened to the place that you say, God, whatever you want me to do, Jesus, whatever it is that you ask, you tell me and I stand ready to be obedient because that is the person that has had an encounter with Jesus. And I want to just say this to you. You know, uh, it's been now about over 35 years, almost 40 years since I had my first encounter with Jesus. I was in jail. My life was broken. It was upside down. Last night I shared some of my testimony. Uh, I don't love my testimony because I just like to tell you how bad and wicked I was. I like to tell my story because I want to tell you how great Jesus is because he touched me in that broken place. And so here I am in jail. He, he, man, he touches and changes my life. But when I walked out of that place, it wasn't like, okay, I'm just going to go back to the same old things. Doing that. Listen, I had an encounter with Jesus, a lot of messed up things going on in my life. But this is the one thing that I knew. God touched my life. I had an encounter with him and my life was this. Jesus, whatever you want to do, my life is an open book and all my failures and all my upside down thinking in every place that I was at. But I knew this, that there was a God of heaven and he met me in that place. That is the difference between an experience and an encounter. And here's what I want to say to you, church. If, this, if, if we are going to have an awakening in America, and let me boil it down, if we're going to have an awakening in Exano Church or in this city, it is going to be because of the presence of God and men and women having an encounter with Jesus in his presence. And listen, that's why it's so important that the presence of God, I want to tell you tonight, simple worship but beautiful worship. The presence of God is in this place. Can somebody shout amen? Like the presence of God is here. That is the very thing that will change uh, people's lives is the glory and the presence of God. And I want to say to you, church, no matter what the programs are, uh, right now you're just a church plant and you know, what, 50 people or so that you have coming to the church and you go, here we are in this little place. I'm going to tell you what, this place I believe God is going to do something something powerful and amazing in time. And let me just say this as a word to you. Don't ever run after numbers. Don't ever run after accolades from people. You run after the presence of God. And when the presence of God is in this place, he will do, he will do what no man can do. I'm going to tell you, those days are ahead. 
You go, well, we're kind of simple right now. We don't have a whole lot. I want to tell you what, you have more than you can imagine. God has blessed this house and he has great things in store. I'm excited. I don't know if you're excited about the future of this church and the church in uh, Mill, the greater Milwaukee area. But I'm going to tell you, first time in Milwaukee, but God, I believe there is something that is happening in the body of Christ. It is time to have an encounter with Jesus, right? Just showing up to church is not going to do the trick. Here's the second thing that I want you to uh, look at. If you, would, uh, if you would turn with me. Um, Paul had an encounter with Jesus. And secondly, Paul had a revelation of God's word. Does anybody have water? It would help me a little bit if you have uh, eight people just went for water. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want you to go with me to Galatians chapter one. So the second thing is Paul had a revelation of God's word. I think this is, I think this is really significant. I'm going to go through a, a couple. We're not going to read all these passages. We're going to come to verse six. But if you read uh, 16 through 18, it, it talks about, Paul says that once he had this encounter with God, he said, I didn't go to the apostles. I didn't go to the uh, other apostles and believers. Uh, he said, I actually, for three years, I just went and I wanted to be alone with God. Now, that's, uh, you know, that's, this is quite a thing because here you have this man. I believe that the apostle Paul is one of the three most brilliant people probably in the Bible and maybe the most brilliant. Moses, incredibly brilliant man. If you, if you don't realize how brilliant Moses is, go back and read the Pentateuch and go, this is a shepherd who wrote the first five books of the Bible. We have a hard time reading it. He wrote it. Yeah. Pretty impressive. Daniel was probably one of the most brilliant people that has ever lived. And I believe that the Apostle Paul may be the greatest writer, preacher, speaker that has ever been on the face of, of the planet. I mean, just take that in for a moment. He was trained as a Pharisee of Pharisees. We know this. He was Jewish to the bone. He knew the word of God. And rather than going to the apostles to hear what they said, he says, I withdrew myself and I went only to be with Jesus. And when he goes to be with Jesus, he has this incredible revelation. I believe that this revelation is what's known as the new covenant. It's what I preach is the new covenant. Your pastor and others will preach this. I believe it is, um, it's not just some side teaching. I will speak for 30 or 40 hours in countries and go through a new covenant. And you can go through entire books and see the power, the word of God and the new covenant. And you go, well, what exactly is this? Well, the new covenant is Jesus died on the cross. And we know that he did a powerful work. Well, what God did with the apostle Paul is he gave a revelation to the apostle Paul so that he would understand fully the effects of what the resurrection meant for believers. And that is, is what's called uh, the, the, the covenant. I think it's the eternal covenant, the first covenant and the last covenant. It's, what, it's the, the, the covenant with Jesus, how he uh, defeated death, hell, and the grave. So we'll talk more about that another time. Tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But here, here is this, this understanding that he has this incredible revelation. If you, go, uh, if, you, if you go up to 11 and 12, it talks about this gospel that's preached, not according to man. Uh, did it, and I didn't receive it from man. I was taught it by a revelation of Jesus Christ. And then go, go with me to verses 6 through 9. And this is what he says. He says, I marvel that you are turning away from him, who so, uh, from him so soon who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel gospel, which is not another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any gospel other than, the, than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, let me say again, anyone who preaches any other gospel message to you um, uh, other than what we have received, let that person be accursed. And you talk about narrow thinking. <laughs> He's going, hey, there's one way. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ in its purest form. And what we do sometimes in the church is we try to mix law and grace. But Paul has this incredible revelation of by grace, through faith, that not of ourself, it's a gift of God. Now listen, he's a man of the law. So the law works like this. If you obey the law, you're blessed. If you disobey the law, you're under a curse. 
Here's what, here's what the apostle Paul discovered. He started reading through and he says, every man that's hung on a tree is cursed. And then he starts to have this revelation. Listen, Jesus was, he died on a tree and he took my curse. So I am there, therefore no longer under a curse. Every curse has been broken and I live in the presence of God and he's with me always. I will never be cursed. I always live under the blessings of God. That's powerful. For a man who lived under, if I do good, I'm blessed. If I do wrong, I'm under a curse. And he begins to have this revelation of the full work of Jesus. His eyes are open. And now he comes to this place and he goes, hey, if you start mixing the gospel with works, let that person be a curse. Now, if you go, well, you know, how deep was this? I'm not going to go there and read it. But if you go to chapter two, go later and read this. Here you have Paul. He comes into a building and Peter is there and he's sitting with the Gentiles. And then some of the Judaizers, which are people that mix law and grace, walk into the room. I think you guys know the story pretty well. So what does Peter do? He was like, hey, uh, Gentiles, I know you've been washed by the blood of Jesus, but I don't really want to be seen with you. I'm going to go over here with these people of the law because you are a Gentile. And we're not so sure if you're really as saved as we are. So I'm going to go over here with the Judaizers because you're hurting me. You ever go to a school lunchroom and everybody walks away from you? And, you know, here, here's the great apostle Peter. He's sitting at the table and he's like, hey, guys, sorry, I got a, I got a jet here because, you know, the Judaizers are walking in and he separates himself. Now, you listen to that and you go, Peter, what are you thinking? And this is what Paul is standing there. And he goes, you're mixing grace and law. And this is what he did. It says, I withstood him to his face. Now, this, I mean, I don't know if you're in a room and you're going, here we have Peter, that Jesus at the gates of hell, you know, like, you're, you're, you know, he speaks that to him. And then you got Paul, the apostle, and now Paul is calling out Peter who walked with Jesus. And he said, I withstood you to your face. And he says, you cannot do this because what you are doing is you are minimizing the work of Jesus. And he says that to Peter. So if you think that when he reads Galatians 1, 6 through 9, that he's playing games, he is so passionate because he understands what it is to be saved and redeemed by the grace of God and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. He gets it. His eyes are open to it. So I want you to see this. He has an encounter with Jesus and then he has this revelation of the word of God. And here's what I'm gonna say, because I know that your pastor believes and understands this message. I wanna tell you, you dive into that message, you understand it, you get a hold of this message of the gospel, because if you go, did, did Paul just go and put his life on the line because he was a nice guy and wanted to please Jesus? I think that there's a certain part of that, but I think that the greatest reason that he went, because he knew he was declared righteous before God, he went because he was so compelled that he wanted everybody everywhere to hear about the goodness of God and the finished work of Jesus. And I want to just ask you this church, this has been lost in America. I go to places in the Middle East where people will die if they tell people about Jesus and they say, well, you just go ahead and kill me because I am going to tell people about Jesus and they go. Church, we have lost the understanding of, listen, having an encounter with Jesus and now a passion for his word. Because when you understand what Jesus did in the cross, on the cross, can I ask you a question? How do we keep our mouths shut? The people that work with us, our neighbors, our friends, our family. And listen, I want to just say this to you. There's, I'm not, this isn't guilt. This isn't condemnation. If you're sitting there going, oh, pastor came to make us feel guilty. I did not come here from Colorado to make you feel guilty. I came for one reason, and I want you to hear this. God, let the passion and the heart of God infiltrate the church of Jesus Christ. We have placed so many things that are important in our lives and we have in many places forgotten that there is lost people that we see every day that don't know Jesus and we have been okay with it. And I want to just say to you, stop being okay with it. When you have an encounter with Jesus and a revelation in his word, I'm going to tell you there is something that will so stir your heart to say, I want to tell every man and woman on this planet about the love of Jesus Christ. 
And that goes both for America. Hey, that's giving to missions. That's giving to people that are doing it overseas. But it is giving. It is going. Church, I believe that God has blessed us in America for one purpose. And that that is so that we can be conduits to take the gospel message of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Can somebody agree with that tonight? Praise God. You are alive tonight. So, all right, here's the, here's the, um, the third thing that I want to talk to you about is this. Paul risked everything. Go to first, go to second Corinthians eleven twenty two. 22. If you just go back a page, you're probably going to hit it right there. Now, Paul is, um, he's got some accusers that's coming against him. He comes to this place and he actually says, I'm, I'm, I'm foolish because these people are questioning my apostleship. And he starts to talk about all the things that he suffered. I'm, I'll go and read the last few verses in a moment. But he talks about everything that he suffered uh, so that he could take the gospel to people that don't know Jesus. And church, now I just want to ask you this question. Like, what have we really suffered? Oh, Joey doesn't like me. Oh, the neighbor thinks I'm weird. That's probably the most that we really... Has anybody here been beaten up for Jesus? I lived in Ireland for eight years. We went on the streets. I saw people beaten up. For, I called out for fights, sped on. But you know what? That's so minor to what other people have gone through uh, to, to proclaim the gospel. What is it really that we've suffered? Um, we have our TVs, our nice couches. I want to tell you, this. I'm glad. Do you, are you glad you live in America? If you're not glad you go to America, go on a missions trip with me to India. And by the time you get back, you'll be very happy you live in America. This is the most blessed and most amazing country in the world. But God, if the result of us living in this blessed, amazing, wealthy country, believe it or not, even after inflation, we're still the most wealthy nation in the world. And if the result of that is for us to spiritually go to sleep, do you know what we've lost? I want to tell you, church, this is what is most important. So the Apostle Paul is here and he's, he's going, hey, here, here's, here's going to be my resume. Rather than reading the resume of all the books that I've written and all the places that I've gone and all the great accolades that I've achieved, I want to talk to you about my suffering. I want to talk to you about what I've gone through. And he goes through, now, the, the, some of the things that he lists is this. He says, I've gone to prison multiple times. You know some of those stories. Countless beatings. Five times, 40 lashes minus one. We know Jesus was whipped when he went to the cross. Paul, five times, had 39 lashes, which means that the lashes took him right to the point of death five times. Look at your neighbor and say, five times. Five times. Listen, you do that to me once, and everything in my power to avoid that a second time or a third time, And you go, why? Well, he just enjoyed pain. No, it wasn't because he enjoyed pain. Well, did he do this? Because he felt like he was going to get points in heaven. Unfortunately, he's the guy that believes in the grace of God and preached it. So he doesn't believe he's getting any extra points in heaven. He's going to go to heaven like everybody else and saved by the grace of God because we're all sinners saved by grace, right? That's what he believes. So he's not getting any extra points in heaven. Why is he doing this? Because he's had an encounter, a true encounter with Jesus. And then he's had a revelation of God's word. And now he's come alive. And he's saying five times, uh, 40 lashes minus one. Three times beaten with rods. Stoned. You know, um, just to throw this out, I don't know if you know this story. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So Paul goes, preaches the gospel, People in the town take him out and they stone him to death. So Bible says they stone him to death. So he's uh, dead. (laughs) And there he's lying, dead. And God raises him up. So now if you're stoned to death, uh, just like Jesus, he had, you know, he had the prince and nail prince in his hand. So when he raises him up, it doesn't mean that now he doesn't have any more like lumps on his head. He just got stoned to death. So he has stones his head, his body, he literally has a crowd of people that stone him, stones him until he dies, and he's laying there dead, and then he gets up. God raises him from the dead. Now, I'm just 
telling you in my flesh. Now, spiritually, I, listen, the Holy Spirit can do what the Holy Spirit does. In my flesh, I'm going, hey, where's the nearest hospital? Where's the next town I can go to? I need to go get something to eat and a glass of water, and I need to rest a little bit. What does the man do? He goes back to the same town of the people who just stoned him. I, I want to just say that that's crazy. I, you know, I, you know I, I bounce bars. I've been in a few fights. I know what it is to get a few lumps on the head. He is stoned to death. And then he goes, you know what? I'm going to go back and tell them. Why? He's going to go back and tell them just because, you know, he's just really liked the way that he got stoned to death and he's hoping that it happens again. No, because he wants them to see the glory and the presence and the miracle working power of God. Now you say, how does a man make that kind of effect in the world that he lives in? Because he was so tenacious. He had an encounter with Jesus, a revelation of the word of God. And church, I want to tell you, the church is desperate for an encounter with God and a revelation of his word. Because if you get that you were lost and going to hell and far from God and your only hope was Jesus and he lived a perfect life and he dies on a cross and he's crucified and three days later he raises and now not because of how good you are but because of how good he did in the finished work of Jesus on the cross now he has raised me to life and if you understand that God whatever you want me to do my life belongs to you and I want the whole world to know how great and wonderful and majestic Jesus is. Right? Come on. And then he goes on to say, I want to read these last couple of verses. And he goes through, uh, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And then it says, beside the other things, when it comes upon me daily, the deep concern for all of the churches who is weak and I am not weak. He's saying, if you think I don't feel, you think I don't hurt like you hurt, you think I don't go through what, I, what you go through, I feel the same emotions that you feel, but I live for the glory of God and I live for the souls of men. That is a man of God, amen? And he says this, and I wanna say this to Pastor Terry, Pastor Aaron, uh, anybody else that may be a pastor here. And then he says, and greater than all of these other things, I carry the weight of the concerns of the church. And folks, I want to say this. They didn't ask me to say this. They're not paying me to say this. I'm saying this is because it's true. You don't realize what pastors go through. Sometimes, you know, people throw mud at pastors, say things, do things to the church, and you go, eh, you know, it's just how people are. But the pastors they carry the weight of that. They carry the weight when people come into the church and wound people and hurt people. All the things that happen in the life of the church. Can somebody say amen? And they carry the concern of that. And Paul's going, hey, the beatings and everything else. But let me tell you as well, I carry the concern, the deep love for the church. And all of this, you say, what drove him? What drove him was he had an encounter with Jesus and a revelation of the word. And then he says, whatever it takes, I will suffer, risk everything, whatever it costs me to take this beautiful gospel message to the ends of the earth. Here's where I'm going to end. I'll finish on this. I want you to go with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. You know, um, I had talked about this portion of scripture when I was in Albania. Uh, this last part, and the church there had been, through, they, actually in 25 years, they were declared a, 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 an atheist country 25 years ago by their leader, and now there's about 300 churches across the nation. The gospel of Jesus Christ is alive in Albania, but there's been a lot of division. Sometimes when people have been wounded and hurt and gone through, the, there's been division in the church, and so uh, they asked me before they had their business, and I shared this I shared it to say, hey, if you want unity in the nation, here's what you have to understand. And here's what I want to say to you. You go, hey, we want unity in the church. How do you get unity in the church? I want to share this with you. And I want to tell you, this may be the most challenging scripture in all of the Bible. I'm just going to be honest with you. And I'm not saying that pastorally, like, we, you know, pastors say every scripture is their favorite scripture, or most challenging. This is literally 
may be the most challenging scripture in the Bible. And I want to read this, and I want it to sink in. This is Paul. He's writing, and he says, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. Is that odd? You know, if somebody comes, my kid comes to me, Dad, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. What do you go? Oh, are you lying? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> But here's the apostle, he's writing in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he starts the, the chapter out going, hey, guys, I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying. And he's saying it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So how many believe that he's speaking the truth and he's not lying? <laughs> but why does he have to say it? Because what he's about to say is so outrageous that nobody can believe it. I literally had to read this 10 times and go, uh, what is this really saying? Because it's that hard. It's that challenging. So he says, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing witness with me. Now he's calling on the Holy Spirit. I am, I am telling you in the power of the Holy Spirit, I am not lying. And then he says this, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. This is the burden of the Lord. Church, we've lost this. Last night was such a beautiful dinner. Great time, joining together, fellowshipping with each other. And you know what? Sometimes the church can be a lot of fun. Uh, hanging out with people, getting to know people. I've done some, some of my best memories are in church. I love church. Uh, some, you know, fun things happen in church at times. But you know what we've lost? We've lost the burden of the Lord. We've lost a burden for the lost. And here on a Saturday night, and I, man, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I'm, I'm I love every one of you. I thank God that you came out on it. I'm talking to the choir tonight. I know it. You guys showed up to church on a Saturday night. The last thing you want to do is have some guy tell you, hey, you're not doing so good. And, and it's not really to you. This is a message to the church, but I think maybe some of you may be at this place. And he's going, I got this continual sorrow. Now, I don't think that we should live with the sorrow all the time. I live pretty joyful. Your pastor... Man, there's some joyful people in this place. It's amen, right? So we thank God for the joy of the Lord. But you know, there's this side of carrying a sorrow because people don't know Christ. Do we sorrow for that anymore? You know, back in the days, some, some of these pastors will tell you the days where people would weep and pray for their loved ones and call out to God. Church, we have to recapture that. We have to recapture that. Not legalism, not making you feel bad and, you know, like you get points with God because you cry at the altar. But no, a deep burden to go, I want to see the world that I live in come to know Christ. And, and, it, and listen, probably the worst thing you can do is walk up to somebody like, oh, man, I just want to tell you, Jesus loves you. You know, that may not be the best way to witness. You know, the joy of the Lord probably works a little bit better than that. But there, this sorrow, this, this anguish of the spirit, this heart that says, God, I'm... I'm I want to see people come to know the Lord. And he's, he's saying that this, this sorrow, this continual grief in my heart, for I could, now the word is could, for I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ. And he just had an encounter with Christ. He's, Jesus is everything that he loves. But he's, so, he's saying that this heart to see people come to Christ is so intense that I could. Now, he couldn't, okay? You can't, like, trade yourself for the nation to be saved. But he said, I, I feel this so passionately that I, that I actually, I could see myself saying, Lord, I will be a curse from Christ. I wanted to say what that means. That means I will go to hell and be separated from Jesus forever because that is the intense way that I love people around me and I want to see my countrymen come to know Christ. I said, can I ask you a question? How far are we from that? How far are we from that? It's not judgment. This isn't legalism. This isn't making you feel bad at church. It's a, it's a call to the church to awaken and go, God, Give us this heart because, listen, we will not have an awakening with people who have free pizza parties. That's not going to bring, bring an awakening to America. Uh, nothing against pizza. I like pizza. But pizza parties are not going to bring an awakening in this nation. It will be when the church of Jesus Christ has an encounter with God and they have a revelation of the word of God 
And they begin to be burdened and say, I want to see my city one. And listen, you talk about unity. What would ever happen, Pastor Aaron, Pastor Terry, if your church began to go, hey, you know what? We have our differences. He, he drives a Ford. I drive a Toyota. Um, you know, uh, he, he does this. She does that. We all have our differences. But we have one common thread that runs in this church. And it's this. We want to have an encounter with Jesus. We want a revelation of the word of God. And we want this city. We want the broken and the destitute. You know, I used to pray this in Jacksonville. I would pray, God, hey, yeah, bring the people who will pay tithes. You're not a good pastor if you don't pray that, right? Uh, So you you look at me. You can judge me all you want. But you got to pay the bills, baby. You just got to pay the bills, right? And not, not only that, but I knew that in order to disciple people, we needed some seasoned believers. So I say, hey, God, we need those people. But God, you bring every drug addict, every prostitute, every gang member. I don't care who they are. I don't care. The ones that nobody else in this city wants, you bring them into this church because I believe that the power of God is in this place and he will change them. And you know what? 10 years, we had about 1,100 people baptized from every background, every place. Why? Because I'm a good preacher? Probably not. You didn't have to say it that loud. He's like, no. No. No, sir, pastor, not because you're a good preacher. You know, it hurts a little bit. It just hurts a little bit. I'm, I'm joking. Uh, it's not, <laughs> I'm really joking. But it's not because I'm a great preacher. It's because I serve a great God. Amen. And that God is powerful and mighty to save church as, as we're closing tonight. I don't know. I'm, um, I don't know. Do we have a worship song or something? Maybe somebody come up and play a little something. You know, I, I never plan altars, so I haven't really thought about this, so just look at me for a minute and I want to think about what we're going to do. I believe the Lord's in this place. And I believe he wants to touch this house. And Pastor Terry, many that's come from Wisconsin Church, um, I believe that God is in this house. You know, what we always do is this. We go, hey, who's, everybody wants an awakening, and we want somebody else to do it. If somebody else can put their name on the line, if somebody else can be the one that shouts from the housetops, well, listen, listen. Here's, the, here's the great part about the gospel and the bad part about the gospel. The great part about the gospel is he wants to use you. The bad part about the gospel is he doesn't have a plan B. It's you. It's the Holy Spirit working through your life to reveal Christ. That's the plan. There's not a plan B. And I want to tell you, you can do all the parties, all the fun thing. You can have the hottest band with the biggest light show and all the entertainment. And guess what? It still comes down to this because that is not going to win a world. Might get a lot of people in the church. It is not going to win the world. What is going to win the world? When the people of God have an encounter with Jesus, a revelation of the word, they risk everything and they carry a burden for the lost. Can can everybody stand? And can I invite you? I just want to invite you. If you would, if you will, can you come, if you will, and gather around the altar? I don't know. Maybe you need to have a fresh encounter with Jesus. Maybe you've been living off of what God did in your life 10 years ago, and you go, I need something fresh from God. Maybe you've never had an encounter. You've had an experience. You've been around church. Um, I'm going to tell you. If, if that's you, you're, you're not the solution. You're the problem. But you don't have to keep being the problem. Because when you have an encounter, that means you become the solution. So maybe it's that. Maybe it's a revelation of the word. God, I want to understand who you are, what you've done, how great and marvelous. Lord, show me. And maybe it just comes down to, Lord, I, I, I've had this encounter. And Lord, I see your word. But God, I've just become a little quiet. I'm not so passionate, but Jesus, I need the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to ask you, God, listen, if you ask anything in faith, he'll do it. You know what? Some people take that uh, scripture and use it for all kinds of things. Can I make you a promise? I want you to hear this tonight. I make you a promise tonight. If you genuinely ask Jesus for a burden and a call to reach the lost, to pray for them, to give, to go, to share with your neighbor, to share with a friend. If you genuinely ask God for a burden for people that are lost, I guarantee you, I 
million percent. I guarantee you, if you genuinely say, Jesus, I want to be a part of an awakening in the generation I live in, I guarantee you, God will do that. What is he asking for? Is somebody who really wants that. Somebody who really desires that. It's not works. Listen, you're, if you're saved, you're going to go to heaven. I don't think that this makes a difference of you go to heaven or you don't go to heaven. Maybe somebody, maybe one of your pastors can tell you something different. I think that the, the more pressing question is this. What has Jesus done in your life? And if he, if that work is that deep, do you not want to tell a world how great and marvelous and wonderful Jesus is? So Lord, these are your people. This is your place. God, I thank you, Lord. You have established Oxano. You have established the Wisconsin church. God, Lord, I know that you're doing great things in both places. But God, I pray for a passion that's so great to see Jesus proclaimed to this city. That God, that you would start a spark in this room and these churches and this place. That God, that would reverberate throughout this city. God, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, whatever I have to risk, whatever I have to lay on the line. Lord, just like Paul said when he was knocked to the ground, Lord, he said, Lord, what is it that you want? God, let me have that kind of faith to say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, whatever, wherever you want me to go, God, let me be obedient to that call. Man, I'm going to tell you what, that is when the life begins. That's when true Christianity comes to life. God, I pray, Lord, for these people tonight, Lord, that you would raise a work up in this house in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. We're going to sing a song of worship, and right where you're at, you pray. If you want one of us to pray, we'll come and pray for you. Uh, but right where you're at, just believe God. And Pastor Aaron will come and close.